is uh, Mid City Neighborhood Organization's monthly community meeting. Our monthly meetings are open to the public, typically take place on the second Monday of the month. And if we were in person, would be at Warren Easton High School historically. Um, and we'll probably resume once uh, it's allowed to do so for outside groups to use the public facilities. Um, if you don't have a copy of our newsletter or tonight's agenda, I'm posting it again in the chat. Uh, we can go through a couple announcements uh, from MCNL before we move through the rest of our agenda for the evening. First thing I wanted to announce, uh, re-announce and reiterate is that we are searching for nominees interested in serving in an upcoming vacancy in the Mid-City Security District. Uh, MCNO appoints uh, a number of the commissioner seats of the five-member commission, and this vacancy would be opening at the end of March. The requirements are to be a registered voter within the district, uh, which you can view on MCNO's webpage under map. I will include that here. It's one of the options to check the boundaries of the security district. So please review information board submitting, and then we will hold a review process, and hopefully the MCNO board will select a uh, commissioner at our next board meeting at the end of the month. Uh, another notice, um, still NOPD is continuing to look for a suspected vehicle involved in a triple shooting uh, in January, uh, the end of January on Bienville Street. Uh, I just want to help continue to signal blast this information. There's pictures of the vehicle involved with the shooting. There's also a reward for information leading to um, through Crime Stoppers. That information is also included on the link. I believe that phone number is 1-877-903-STOP. Um, that information is included also in our newsletter that went out. Um, a few announcements for neighborhood engagement, uh, a couple meetings and events coming up for them. There is the uh, Neighborhood Leaders Roundtable that's coming up in a few weeks. Uh, and the focus is going to be on public safety. So if you could review that information um, and the presenters and register before the event, uh, which is going to be Tuesday, March 23rd at 2 p.m. And then also in to some people's interest, this is going to be uh, kind of a transportation New Orleans. Uh, there's a slow quarter chatterette on Monday, March Eighth, I guess that's right now. Did not check the date on that before I copied that meeting information. Uh, it's a slow quarter concept that I think is discussing uh, pedestrian zones in the French Quarter. Um, there was a second public meeting scheduled for this evening, uh, and if they're still going on, I encourage you to jump over and attend. So, do we have uh, both of our representatives here this evening? Hey, Chris. This is hey, Representative Matt. Willard. So we wanted to have our uh, state representatives, or two of our four state reps, and then also we Mid-City encompasses two state Senate districts. Um, but we wanted to talk about the upcoming legislative session and get some information to people out because it's coming up very soon. Uh, in fact, I think it starts on the night of our, our uh, April meeting. A so April 12th. So do you want to go ahead and cover anything? Sure. 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 How, how much time do I have? Uh, I mean, between five and seven minutes. Okay, great. Uh, so good evening, everyone. My name is Matthew Willard. I'm the state representative uh, for District 97. I was elected in 2019. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Wish we could be in person, but hopefully that day will come soon. Um, so yeah, we have a, a fiscal session starting on April 12th. And what that means is the focus of the legislative session is around tax policies uh, and fiscal affairs. Uh, so during a fiscal session, members can file as many fiscal and tax policy bills as they want, but we are limited to um, five general bills. Um, so that kind of changes the dynamics. Um, I am on the Ways and Means Committee on the House side, which means that all of those tax policy bills will come before my committee 
Um, so I'll, I'll present like a, a quick update on some of the discussions that I've been hearing about and some of the tax policies that um, you could expect to be hearing about in the media. Um, there is a big push for comprehensive tax reform for the state of Louisiana, uh, and it's, it's not necessarily unwarranted. Uh, some of our tax policies uh, kind of ding our, our ranking compared to other states in the country. Um, so there's an effort to sort of clean up a lot of that. So one of the big measures that you'll hear about, uh, which will essentially ping, uh, I guess, position the legislature against local governments, is the idea of a centralized tax collector. Um, so right now, when businesses uh, operate in multiple parishes, they have to deal with numerous collection systems. So there's a big effort on behalf of the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate to centralize this system to where it goes into um, one source. So if you're a business owner, instead of you hopping into an online portal to file your, your taxes in Orleans Parish, in Jefferson, in Tanchapahoa, you would hop into one system and do all of that. The issue with it is that by each municipality collecting its own taxes, they actually get to keep a portion of that. So if we move to a centralized tax collector system, uh, our local governments will be um, financially impacted. Uh, and New Orleans is, is in a position to actually lose out on a lot of money. Same thing with Jefferson Parish. So um, that's like a brief uh, breakdown of that proposal. Uh, and you'll definitely be hearing a lot more about that in the media. There's also an effort to uh, restructure our personal income tax um, categories in Louisiana right now. We have three tax rates, uh, two, four, and six percent. Uh, and there's a move to only go to two at two and four percent. Um, there's a there's an effort to restructure corporate uh, income taxes. Um, there's an effort to do away with franchise tax. Um, there's an effort to Franchise tax is uh, like if you're a franchised company, say you own a McDonald's or uh, a Lowe's or, um, you know, uh, a Best Buy or something like that, um, and you're a franchisee, you have to pay an additional tax in Louisiana. That's uh, not done in all states. Um, there's also an effort to reduce the severance tax. The severance tax um, is a tax that's levied uh, when you extract natural resources uh, from Louisiana. So that could be uh, oil and gas, that could be uh, lumber, that could be sulfur. Uh, so there's an effort to, to reduce that tax as well. Um, the problem with everything that I mentioned is, is kind of twofold, right? Uh, number one, uh, it, it, it'll take away money from the state's budget. OK, and when we take away money, if we can't account for it, if it's not done in a revenue neutral manner, um, that means that we have to make budget cuts. And those cuts usually come to education and health care, uh, two things that we certainly can't afford to, to be cutting in Louisiana, especially during a pandemic. Um, as, as far as the income tax and the corporate income tax and some of the other structures, um, my my main focus on the Ways and Means Committee is to make sure that everything is done in a fair and responsible manner. Uh, for instance, you know, I'm okay uh, lowering the, the tax burden for some of our families, but I'm not okay if the burden just shifts to some of our working poor and families that are at or below the poverty line. So those are some of the, the tough discussions that we'll be having in the legislature. Um, there's also another one, the inventory tax credit, which is an additional tax on businesses for um, uh, furniture and inventory that they're carrying. They, they get taxed on that as well. Um, I'd love to do away with that inventory tax, the problem, again, is that it hits our local budget. Uh, so if, if Louisiana was to do away with this inventory tax, um, New Orleans would stand to miss out on about $10 million, which would have to be accounted for in the city's budget. Um, so that's kind of a quick, 
you know, review of, of the major tax um, policies that we'll be hearing about during the upcoming session. Um, and I do want you to know that I will prepare kind of a rundown that I'll send to all my different neighborhood associations. Um, so you can disseminate to, that to all the members and it'll provide a little bit more clarity as well as the bill, as well as um, the links to the bills so that you can actually look at it and read the bill. Um, as far as my bills come, I'm working on a child tax credit for Louisiana. Um, and if you've been watching the stimulus plan that the Senate approved over the weekend, um, it included an increase to the child tax credit, the federal program. Louisiana does not have a such program. Um, the way I would structure it would be just like the federal one, which means it's refundable, which means once you apply that tax credit, if your tax burden is negative, you actually get a refund check. And I think that would be, um, it, it's much needed. And I think it would go a long way for our families in Louisiana, especially as we struggle to continue paying for the cost of child care services. Um, another bill that I think is important to mention uh, for the mid city area is I'm working on a bill that would limit the increase in property assessments only in Orleans Parish. Um, you know, when I was campaigning, I had a lot of people tell me that their property assessments were getting out of hand. Uh, I've worked with uh, Representative Hilfrey on this issue. Last year, she passed a constitutional amendment, which actually raised the income threshold uh, for the senior tax freeze. So the constitutional amendment that I'll be running this year is to limit the increase in property assessments in New Orleans at 10%. So uh, and it's, it's based on your previous year's assessment. So if your assessment goes up, you know, in 2021 and you get reassessed in 2024, it can only go up 10% um, based on what it did in 2021. The fair market value of your property is not affected, only the assessed value, which is your taxable um, value um, for property tax purposes. Um, do I have any more time, Chris, or, or uh, is that? Absolutely. Oh, hey, okay. Chris and Matthew, I'm on. I'm Matt, I don't. Can y'all hear me? Yes, I can hear. It's yeah. Stephanie. Hey, I apologize. I tried to get on on the computer, and it would let me in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I figured I'd call. Um, Matt, that was a great um, summary, and um, you know, being on the the way committee certainly gives you uh, an upfront look at that. Um, and I've got a two-year-old with me, so in case anything goes crazy um, on mine. Um, but yes, I think certainly the centralized tax collection, that's something that if anyone um, you know remembers Representative Julie Stokes, that was something she worked very closely on as well. And um, I think we are either the only state or one of the only states that has multiple tax collectors, but there's also the local impact that has to be considered. And Matt, I'm so glad we. I heard you talk about the child tax credit. I'd love to to talk to you more about that um, and understand, you know, what your mechanism is and how we can work together on that, as well as the um, one Great. for the the assessor in Orleans. Um, I will mention if we have anyone that lives um, on Norman Francis Parkway on this call. I had a call today with. Um, uh, secretary, um, uh, the secretary of the Office of Motor Vehicles today, uh, Karen St. Germain, uh, to see about if, I, I don't know who on the call, you know, one lives on Norman Francis Parkway and two has gone through um, changing their um, vehicle registration and license address. I'm asking them that that be able to be done online. Right now, it currently requires you to go into the Office of Motor or the DMV. Um, so we're working through a mechanism where that could be done online. So stay tuned. We're, we're working with um, the Office of Technology um, to, to formulate that on their website. Uh, but I know y'all are running short on time. So I apologize for being tardy and not being able to get onto the Zoom. No, no, no worries. Um, do we want to talk about the reason we're, we're approaching so much tax legislation at this coming session? Yeah, so the reason is every other year is uh, what is noted uh, called a fiscal year in the legislature. And uh, what that means is it's twofold. One is that you are limited on the number of general bills, um, and that would be any bill outside of a fiscal bill, meaning it's either raising a fee or uh, creating a tax or a local bill. And usually local bills are signified by um, 
uh, they're only pertaining to one municipality, they're publicly noticed, so on and so forth. So they're shorter in length. They're um, only two weeks, uh, two weeks, two months, excuse me. Two months. Um, and there is a, thank you, Matt. I wish it was <laughs> <And> two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and there's also that limited scope and there's a limited number of bills. Um, so certainly uh, the committee on which, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm calling you Matt, but um, uh, Rep. Willard sits is going to see a lot of um, bills coming up because the Ways and Means Committee is where um, all of the tax legislation does start. And so they will see, you know, all of those different proposals. And um, as, as Rep. Willard explained, um, it, it's looking at what is the overall effect on the state's budget. And each one of those bills will have a fiscal note attached to it. And these are all, by the way, publicly available for you to see um, once the bill is filed. Uh, the Legislative Fiscal Office puts together what's referred to as a fiscal note, which um, looks to project the economic impact of that bill over a five-year period. Um, sometimes you'll see ones that say zero, and then if you look down in the paragraphs, it will further explain there's an uh, indeterminate effect on this, but we would uh, potentially expect and then give a number. So um, that's a way to look at some of these proposals. Um, and certainly, Rev. Willard and I are going to look at that from the state perspective, but as well from the local perspective, um, because that's certainly an impact that we're going to see as well. So it's looking at both of those those levels um, and what the impact could potentially be. Yeah, I just wanted to bring One that other up. Thing. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Finish. go ahead. Uh, yeah. One other thing I'll mention of local um, interest potentially is I'm working. Sorry, that's not you. Um, I am working on legislation as it relates to uh, sewage and water board and billing, and how the council is able to able to oversee. Um, I, you know, I, if anyone on this call, I know <laughs> personally I've had you know issues with the billing. I know many of my constituents have have contacted um, our office about issues with the billing. Um, so we're, we're looking to see, I'm reviewing the legislation this week, uh, so I don't have the exact um, um, structure of it or else I would share it on this call, but that's something else I'm, I've been working on. And that would provide more oversight directly to the council themselves. Yeah, to allow them to address some of these billing concerns that people have, yes. Um, I, I wanted to bring up the, the fiscal session because, I mean, we kind of saw a little bit of this with, with during COVID um, kind of inception during the regular session last year. I know a lot of these impacts to the state budget couldn't be addressed immediately. Um, and I did want to bring up that, you know, a lot of this business going on with the fiscal sessions carry over from last year, correct? Well, uh, yeah. some, some of, I mean, we're certainly going to have to deal with the effects of um, the pandemic and how that relates to um, the state budget. Uh, but the fiscal session was going to occur um, right. regardless. I think sometimes, and perhaps what you're referring to, because I see where you're going, is um, a special session can be called mm -hmm. if it is not a fiscal year, which is, it, so that might be, yeah. So a special session can be called in which the call can address, and the, the call enumerates what can be addressed within that fiscal session. Um, or within that session, special session. Um, and, yeah. and last year, we also had some tax bills that attempted to suspend certain taxes that we have in the state. Um, some of those, for the most part, they failed. Uh, but the reason those were done was to, um, I guess, help businesses during the COVID pandemic, uh, but they couldn't actually put it on the books as a permanent um, suspension. They couldn't remove it permanently because it was not a fiscal session. So some of those tax policies I talked about earlier, you may have heard about last year, uh, but this year they're trying to, you know, do away or alter it permanently, whereas last year it would only be temporary. Great. So much for that clarity. Um, do we have any questions for our representatives this evening? Any comments in the chat? Um, yeah, thank you for the information about the uh, finance office. I put the link in the chat, the fiscal office. You're on it. Oh, yeah. There, oh, yeah. You sent that. Thanks, Matt. I but, did. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, right. if you, if you ever want to, the, the site is actually pretty easy to search. It's, legis.la.gov um, and you will see where you can search bills 
um, either by subject matter, by a certain keyword, by individual legislator, or if you happen to have the bill number, you can search that way as well. Just make sure you're in the current session, which would be the 2021 regular session. All right, last call for any questions or comments. Uh, I distributed both your office phone numbers and official emails in the chat and then went out with the newsletter as well. So um, please follow up if you have any comments or questions on pending legislation and don't hesitate to reach awesome. out to our representatives. Thanks everyone. Thank you all have so much evening. for the time. Yeah, thank you for showing up. Thanks for attending. Yep. Thanks, bye. All right. Uh, Moving uh, one more form of business is Olin. Are you on the meeting? Olin Parker. No, I don't think I must have a conflict. Um, all right, uh, on to the next item of business. Uh, uh, Heather McGowan from St. Margaret's. I think you're on mute. There you go. All right. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Happy to join you guys. Um, Wish it were in person, uh, but again, hopefully we'll be past that soon. Um, I am the vice president of St. Margaret's Foundation. Um, I joined the organization uh, the summer before COVID. Um, so, you know, real estate development has definitely taken a sharp turn um, in the last few months, obviously. Uh, but I'm here tonight to update you guys on the status of the plans for the former Mercy Hospital. I know everyone's very curious. Um, the plan remains uh, CCRC, which is a um, continuous care retirement community uh, focused on, on senior living. Uh, the plan is to develop the existing facility, um, renovate it using historic tax credits uh, to provide independent living assisted living, memory care, and to expand the skilled nursing facility offerings as well. Um, so we really think it's you know hugely needed within the local community. Um, it's ideally situated, um, you know, being close to downtown. So children could, you know, visit parents in the area and we think it'll really bring a lot to the local community. Um, you know, we were really making progress Pre-COVID, um, you know, COVID hit, and we really saw the financial market just completely, you know, freeze overnight. We're starting to see some signs of that softening, um, you know. So that that outlook is is positive, um, especially with the rollout of the vaccine, um, you know. And so we think that as the vaccine, you know, continues to roll out, and um, you know public response changes and everyone starts to feel more comfortable, um, we'll, we'll really see uh, more progress um, in those markets very quickly. Um, you know, on the daily front, um, just want to make sure everybody understands that um, we are trying, we are trying to keep it clean, I promise. Um, we've, uh, we've had our grounds people out there uh, multiple times and we are going to increase the frequency which with with which they clean up the trash um i know i was frustrated last month when i, I went out there um after having received the email pictures of a you know a completely clean facility for the most part litter wise um and three days later um you know frustratingly there was an unbelievable amount of trash and so we are looking at that, you know, we're going to increase the frequency there of cleanup, but unfortunately it's just, it's never ending. Um, we continue to repeatedly fix the fence. Um, you know, vandals cut holes in that repeatedly, um, but we're trying there as well, I promise. Um, on the graffiti side, um, unfortunately, there's, there really seems to be no good answer there. We spent thousands covering graffiti. It seems like, you know, I know the last time we did it, the, um, within 24 hours, it, it came back almost tenfold. Um, it's almost as if we're, we're daring the vandals to, you know, come in and make it worse when we take those types of steps. But, um, you know, we do we do want everyone to understand that we absolutely are trying to, you know, 
do what we can to to keep it clean um you know pending the the new development in the area um, but unfortunately it's it's not a perfect system so with that um chris do you have any questions for me uh yeah i mean uh, do we know uh <laughs> Sorry, I mean, have have there been any success or input on identifying some of the people who are responsible with gaining access or damaging the property? Um, and are could there be any more semi permanent measures uh, to secure a facility? You know, I asked a lot of those same questions early on as far as, you know, semi permanent, you know, the fence is there and it has the, the barbed wire around the top in most places and the vandals just cut it. Um, it you know, I, I don't have any specific knowledge of actions taken when an OPD does go out to the property um, and, and sees uh, trespassers or vandals um, in the area. Um, so I'm not sure um, to a point of, you know, whether or not it's a specific person um, repeatedly. Um, I just, I'm not sure of that um you know but beyond that you know we board up the windows they knock them down but we do continue to um replace uh and try to repeatedly secure the windows especially on you know the first two floors of course um again it doesn't last long but you know we try there as well and hey. ask a question sure go ahead sure. Um, has it been, or have you looked into hiring a security company to secure the property and that way work that is being done will not get undone and maybe a little bit of progress could be made in terms of catching up and at least preventing any future vandalism? Right, right. Um, you know, our inquiries to that in the past have been it's just <sighs> loss prohibited for... Um, you know, the, the facility is owned by nonprofits. Um, and so, you know, the regular ongoing security is just cost prohibited. Um, there is, I have noticed, you know, when I drive by from time to time, um, there's a security guard for the greenway that sits at that corner, um, at the contact corner. Um, so I am hopeful that, you know, he seems to be very, in close proximity, um, you know, to where people tend, I believe, to frequently enter. So, you know, hopefully that's providing some help, but again, not a complete fix, I understand. Um, so additionally, is there anything that can be done about continuously emptying the basement when it fills up? We absolutely do continuously um, empty the basement. Um, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds. Um, because the, because of, as I understand it, the power at that, at the immediate proximity, um, mm. isn't working. So we do have to call in a, a contractor to bring a pump, but we do pump that, um, rather frequently, um, you know, during the, Summertime, obviously, it's it's um, more frequent, but we do that. Um, I know we've also had the basins cleaned, um, during, especially you know in advance of storms, of course, um, to try to keep those those open. But it it does seem to be in a lower area. Um, I know the nursing home gets water in its parking lot as well during heavy rains. Sure. Um... Yeah, that's a definitely a continued concern, especially during the summer months, um, as it's warming up now for the for the year, mm -hmm. uh, to continuously address. Uh, is there any other mitigation for possible um, mosquito breeding other than maybe continuously pupping? Um, I mean, I know there might be you know, a, some sort of chemical available, or is there a way that you all can maybe partner with the city's mosquito termite? department to maybe provide, um, you know, limiting of mosquito breeding from that stored water? Uh, 
Yeah, please shoot me the contact information, please, for that city department. And I'm absolutely happy to reach out. Um, you know, my concern with putting anything into the water would be um, any environmental concerns if we had to remove it or if it got into other systems within the building. Um, but Chris, no, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I wouldn't, I'm happy to reach out to the city's department for mosquito control and see what their suggestions might be. Sure. Uh, a question from our contact form. Uh, is there a difference uh, from the plans that were proposed before COVID or due to the developer uh, selection um, since last year in our last update on the on the project? Um, I don't believe so. Um, although I don't recall plans being presented at the last meeting. Well, I think the um, last meeting was just the idea of the use for the space and, you know, as, no, as CCRC. So. Right. And CCRC is just the industry term for the continuous care retirement community. Um, so no, it's absolutely the plan remains senior living. Um, again, for anyone who has joined the call um, since I started, um, that would entail development as a portion being independent living, essentially um, condos, uh, condos for, you know, people in the 55 to 65 year age category, perhaps, um, assisted living facilities, skilled nursing and memory care facility. Um, so that continues the plan of senior living in the area, absolutely. Would the, I know you were searching for an operator. I know there's financing um, issues going on right now with the project. Would the, the selection of an operator dictate how the space is developed and actual architectural plans for the space? Um, yes and no. And, you know, I think that, you know, when we select an operator and make a final decision there, we would absolutely be looking to um, get their thoughts and their their expertise as, you know, the ones who manage these types of facilities and look for their input. Um, but it, I do certainly think it would be collaborative in nature, um, of course. Um, architecturally speaking, because of the historic tax credits um, that are required uh, to fund the development, um, you know, that obviously places a good bit of um, regulatory constraint on what we can and can't do there. Uh, are you aware of the, the plans for the protected bike lane on this stretch of Bienville Street? I think we had a comment that came into the forum about this. Um, I believe construction is slated to, there's been a lot of input and concern about the, the fact that this project is not going to be in any shape or form developed on before there's a major street uh, layout change. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously construction would impact the change to protective bike lanes and this bike infrastructure that's uh, starting, but um, I'm not sure it's really a question for you. I just want to know if you're aware of this and the investment that the, the city and the state's putting in on Bienville Avenue. No, of course. And I'm sure that, you know, we will absolutely work with, um, you know, whatever those plans are. And I, I don't think it, um, it'll be detrimental to the project in any way. Um, you know, construction is, is flexible and, um, We'll work around it and work with it. And, um, you know, I think it's it's a great addition to the community. So we're happy to see that there. All right. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I mean, I think people, residents are obviously frustrated. Um, you know, the continued illegal access to the property, um, you know, the visual lack of maintenance just securing the property is frustrating and it's continued state of disrepair. Um, and <laughs> kind of at our, at our sort of wits in and, and want to convey that to you as well. So I, I, I have a comment. Sure. Hi, hope you can hear me. Is there 
been any progress on getting a financer or like what is the holdup? And if there is a holdup, how is St. Margaret's trying to find more operators or financers? And what is the timeline for you guys? Like what is the ideal timeline? How soon can we expect you guys to find an operator? To, right, absolutely. Um, and believe me, we, we want to see it happen as soon as possible, both St. Margaret's and, um, you know, the rest of the ownership group. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, to your question about the, the operator, the operator, I don't, the operator is not a holdup, um, you know, it, in my opinion at all. Um, it's really the, you know, the financial markets. Um, this is a, it is, a significant uh, project financially um, with a good bit of complexity there um, that, you know, even in even in a non pandemic um, error um, is something that, you know, is timely, um, time consuming. Um, the holdup on the financial markets right now is, you know, COVID um, coupled with you know, obviously perceptions about, you know, senior living care um, and, you know, investors being nervous about lending um, in that area. But, you know, again, um, it's been a lot, it, it's been a long road with COVID, but we are absolutely starting to see I think, the light at the end of the tunnel, um, you know, knock on wood. Um, we're starting to pursue the, or, Repursue the HUD financing option. HUD has programs that are um, specific to senior living facilities, um, and you know we view that as a probably a more um, perhaps reliable source of financing, um, but one that moves rather slowly. Um, you know, even pre-COVID, a HUD financing um they say on a good day takes nine months um to go from start to finish through that process um so yes i, I i'm i sympathize i understand that it, it, it's frustrating that you know we can't we can't walk into the bank and and line up the the millions of dollars that we need to you know get the shovels in the ground immediately and um covid certainly didn't help things but you know, again, I, I think we are seeing positive signs um, in that regard, and we're very hopeful that, you know, we can we want to get something done as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, to Chris's point, again, with just there being no outward signs of maintenance, um, you know, please do understand we do. We have we're trying. It just doesn't last very long. We send grounds crews out there and they pick up and, you know, 48 hours later, you can't tell. Um, and so it's it's a constant struggle. It's a constant battle. Um, but, you know, for more specific concerns, Chris has my email address. Sure. You know, please feel free to contact me. Um, and this might be a question for the board, but it, would there be a time frame where... Um, current owners and St. Margaret's eventually decide to walk away and not choose to develop the site. Is that a question to the St. Margaret's? Yeah. I mean, probably more St. Margaret's board be, it'd be a financial decision and organizational decision, but um, I know St. Margaret's isn't the only owner of the property, um, but more of the, or only not the only investor to the property, but um, would there be a possible, decision at some point in time to either demolish Raz or sell uh, if, if these um, plans can't move forward? Right. Um, I can tell, I can't speak for our board and obviously I can't speak for the co-ownership. I can tell you that I've never had those conversations. Um, it's certainly, you know, not within my horizon. I mean, St. Margaret's wants to see this done. Um, St. Margaret's is right behind, um, you know, it is our backyard and we will try like heck. Um, we will keep trying. Um, 
you know, again, I can't speak for the board um, and that's not, it, but we've never had those conversations. Um, it would be a shock to me um, if that happened. So if that's the concern, um, no reason, no reason to, to panic there. Sure. Uh, one more comment. Um, is there anything about uh, security lighting that could be assessed for certain areas that, I mean, I know electrical access is a problem with the site and you mentioned that with the pumps, but, um, and I know that um, there may not be, um, you know, street lighting is just not enough for the property being dark. Well, and actually, so the, the electrical issue at the pump area um, is specific to that. And I, I do, okay. I did notice though, Chris, that the street lights along Conti had been out for a while, or at least a few times when I drove by. Um, and when I drove by at night, uh, within the last two weeks or so, um, it looked like those street lights had been replaced, um, which hopefully is helpful. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if the security lighting would, um, would help act as a deterrent um, or not. That, that side area does have more lighting because of the St. Margaret's um, side being right next to it. Uh, has St. Margaret's kicked off any fundraising specific to this or any campaigns to raise uh, funds for this project or other projects in the past? Um, this is not one that, you know, St. Margaret's has sought outside donations for um, from the community now. Okay, last but if anybody's last. willing to write a million dollar check, I'm here. <laughs> All right. Any uh, any final questions, comments? All right. Well, thank you so much for the update. And uh, I've included your email address in the newsletter, which I can't seem to get to at this moment. Otherwise, I'd put it in the chat. But uh, can you just, uh, uh, sorry, spell it out for us real quick. <laughs> sure. It's H. McGowan, it's M as in Mary, C G O W A N at Saint Margaret's in O dot org. All right. Well thank you so much uh, for giving us an update and we'll we'll keep in touch and and uh, definitely continue to echo concerns of, of the community and the surrounding neighbors. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, um, moving on with the rest of our agenda. Um, we would like to invite our uh, congressional candidates to introduce themselves. Um, if you're not aware, there's a special election going on for two right now. Um, you have the deadline for registration has passed because early voting has already started but there are still some deadlines that have not presented themselves to register for vote by mail. Um, those that information just entered into the chat. Early voting uh, ends on the 13th and then election day is on March 20th. So, but please uh, register to vote because um, I don't want to make any predictions, but uh, it is an open field and in there will probably be a runoff for this election. So um, I'm just going to go down the numbered list on the ballot. So uh, candidate Chelsea Ardwan, are you on? Yes, can you hear and see me at this point? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so hi, I'm Chelsea Ardwan, obviously running for Congress in this second district. Uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to introduce myself and my vision. For now, let me just say I have two degrees, one from LSU in kinesiology with a psychology minor and my MBA from the University of New Orleans, as well as my HR certification from SHRM. So um, I currently work in the HR department at Intergy Corporation in New Orleans, where um, I've been there for a couple of years and worked in the healthcare industry for several years before that. I've never run for office before, but I believe public service is a very high calling. 
With that said, like most voters do, I believe that we should have congressional term limits um, and term limits set at all levels of government. Um, in case you're wondering, yes, I am a registered Republican and I do have a piece of hair that is driving me crazy in my face. I apologize. Um, so I am a registered Republican, but I'm not your typical Republican. And more importantly, I'm a Christian. And some may say I'm not your typical Christian either. But I do not believe anyone on earth um, should make that judgment. So I consider myself very socially progressive and very fiscally responsible, uh, fiscally conservative and responsible. <laughs> you and I work hard for our money, and um, I believe there's an important role for government at all levels, but I don't believe in allowing government to waste our hard-earned dollars. If there's one thing that the elections of 2020 taught us, it's that American voters are desperately in, the, in need of healing. Extremists on both sides of the aisle uh, and current political spectrum have divided our country more than any time in the last 150 years. I want to help that healing, and I know I'm best positioned to do that. That is because I'm not your typical Republican candidate, and the second congressional district is not your typical district. So. Um, a little bit more about myself. I guarantee that citizens in our district want several of the same things that Republicans like me want. Um, a safe and secure country, state, and neighborhood. A budget plan that will encourage growth and not burden future generations with the bill. A social justice system that will treat every American citizen with fairness and respect. A healthcare system that is accessible and affordable to all. A business climate where entrepreneurs are not strapped with undue regulation, taxes, or expenses. A clean and healthy environment that helps grow our economy. Term limits on elected officials so new ideas and new leaders emerge. And the list can go on and on. Though this is one of the largest political districts in Louisiana, I will campaign with unwavering enthusiasm, listening first, and then offering my ideas and suggestions to those throughout the state. I appreciate you guys giving us this opportunity to introduce ourselves briefly, and you'll find me number one on your ballot on March 20th. Again, I'm Chelsea Ardwin. My website is chelseaardwin.com. Really uh, pushing for donations just to run a balanced budget, as I would like our uh, nation to run a balanced budget as well. So if you any help there would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you for taking the time this evening and your due process in listening to each candidate. Really appreciate that. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, is Belden Baptiste in attendance? Number two. Number three, uh, Mr. Bernard, class and Bernard. I see you're on the meeting. Will you introduce yourself? Say a few things. I think you're still muted, sir. Trying to talk. There we go. All right. Hey, good right. evening, everyone. How are you? I um, it's a pleasure. You know, I, you know, I'm running in congressional district two, and um, I'm sorry about that. You know, the the American dream is a dream that is not out of reach of anyone. You know, I'm an immigrant to this country, and I'm the living example of the American dream. You know, faith, family, hard work, and education is the way to succeed in America. Education being the number one way to end poverty, in my estimation, and many people. You know, Congressional District 2 have been struggling. We've been struggling because, um, you know, the people are the prescription to the problems, um, have not been applied in ways that really help the people to become self-sufficient and actually empower them to make decisions for themselves. Case in point, I'm, I'm for a system that allows parents to be in control of where their children go to school. I'm also in favor of a system that allows teachers to make as much money as they can. You should get paid based on what you're worth, not what the government say you're worth. Now, there are obstacles to that, and for that, I'm for um, a more privatized system in certain areas. There are government-run systems that works well more, more so in the, um, the wealthier areas, but in inner city, which... Um, America, especially in my congressional district, this system just hasn't been working. You should not be doomed to a life of poverty based on where you live. You know, um, we shouldn't have 40% of children within our district living in poverty. You know, we, we shouldn't have the second worst city, our, our quality of life city to live in, in our congressional district. Now, 
the strength of our community is the family. Faith and family is important. And we need systems that elevate the family. We need, we need to encourage systems that will reward um, families staying together. You know, the welfare system, we need to incentivize people to move off the welfare within three and five years and also provide them with um, incentives once they get off the welfare state. Because the stronger our um, community is in terms of family, the stronger we are as a faith, the stronger we are as a community. And my, my goal is, you know, I'm an athlete. I'm an immigrant from Jamaica. I went to LSU, won the national championships, won, um, you know, been to two Olympic Games, won a Commonwealth Games gold medals. And um, also, I'm an author. Because when I came here, someone says, you can become whatever you want to be. I'm not saying there are not obstacles, but the greatest obstacles and impediment that I see in Congressional District 2 is the ones put in place by officials, our government, um, government officials, our people pretending that they care about the people. And I'm here to offer them an alternative choice. So I'm looking forward for them making an informed decision, getting to know who I am, going to BernardForCongress.com. Again, they can go to BernardForCongress.com. We know we're in early voting. My number is, ballot number is number three. And I will say this, majority of my district is black. Focusing on black issues is American first issues. I believe in small government. I believe life begins at the inception. I believe a man has a right to, to protect his property, his life and liberty. And the government does not get to dictate your life it does not get to dictate your liberty, and it does not get to dictate how you use your properties. So I am for empowering the family, empowering our community, putting, putting opportunities in the hands of the parents to make informed decisions for their children's future. And one, one last point, quality early childhood education has a, is, is a great prescription for many of our children within our district. It has been proven over and over that by the time People who are enrolled in those um, programs get to age 27, they are already solid middle class. And all they have to do is finish high school with a proper skill, get married, stay married, get a job, keep a job, and they're able to live the American dream. Now, that's not saying okay. they're not evils out there. I'm not Sorry. saying that. Sorry, but, Mr. Bernard, we're a little bit limited on time. Can I get there? <laughs> look, uh, look, hey, and I appreciate you. Look, I have, you know, I appreciate you giving me time. I have to go into another event that I'm slated to be at. But uh, I thank you guys and um, look forward to sometimes spending more time with you. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Uh, right. Is anyone from uh, representing Troy Carter on the call? Um, uh, I was asked, uh, he's number four on the ballot, number three on the ballot, uh, State Senator Karen Carter-Peterson. Uh, she asked to share a video message because she couldn't be in attendance this evening. Give me one second. Hey guys, do, do you hear me? This is Greg Wright, Republican candidate for Congress. Do you guys hear me all right or not? Hello? I'm sorry. I'm just being told there's no sound. No sound? Hold on a second. No sound. There's no sound from no, there, there is sound for Greg. No, no. Yeah, can you give me a second?
So while we're waiting, do you want me to go ahead and go ahead? I'm I'm a Republican candidate for Congress. Do you want me to go ahead? No, sir. Can you please wait? Absolutely. Thank you. Still no sound. No sound. Is there still no sound? No, there's there's no sound. Could okay. Maybe well, then, we can play her at the end or something. Like that. Yeah, that's not going to work. Sorry. All right, going down the list uh, is Gary Chambers. Anyone from Gary Chambers, number six on the ballot? Uh, Harold John, number seven on the ballot. Uh, Jay Christopher Johnson, number eight. Uh, I don't want to mispronounce your name, but Brandon Jolicoeur. Number nine on the ballot. Number 10 on the ballot, Lloyd M. Kelly. Are you in attendance? Number 11, Mr. Lorette. How you doing? Greg right here. Thanks so much. Sorry about that. I um, I wanted to come in person, actually. I'm not sure if you guys are having this in person or not. Or is, it, is it Zoom only or is it also in person? Remote only, sorry. Okay, cool. Good. So that saves us a drive, I guess. Okay. So uh, Greg right here. Um, I'm the only American First candidate uh, on the ballot. Um, I want to get shots in America's arms quickly uh, and effectively. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of background noise where I am right now. Um, I'm a military veteran. I'm a cybersecurity expert. Um, I'm, I'm the only American first candidate on the ballot. My opponent that just uh, dropped off uh, actually uh, is Republican name only. He actually voted for Biden. Um, that's just facts. I like the guy. He's a nice guy, athlete, ni nice guy. But the fact is, he, he voted for Biden, the guy who's screwing up our uh, immigration system as we speak. So if you if you like Biden, don't vote for me. Um, I'm I'm a hardcore um, conservative. Um, I'm going to reopen the economy and um, push back to work, and I'm going to take on big tech because I, I am big tech. I worked at Microsoft for ten years. I'm going to take on big tech, and I'm, I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get us trained, and I'm I'm going to be available afterwards. If you want to go to uh, call me with any questions you might have, go to greg2021.com. To donate or Greg, uh, excuse me, LoretteCongress.com to uh, check me out. Give me a text message and um, I'll be happy to engage with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mr. Lorette. Uh, going down the list of, uh, is do we have Mindy McConnell in attendance? That's number 12 on the ballot. Number 13, Desiree Ontiveros. Number 14, Jeanette M. Porter. And number 15, Sheldon Vincent in attendance. All right. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, like I said, early voting has already started. LA Congressional 2 seat uh, has begun. Uh, election day is March 20th. I posted information to sign up for Extended deadlines for uh, absentee vote by mail. So, Chris, uh, Bob, yes, sir. Yeah, can you just ask if there's anybody else? I had told most of them because I thought we were going to be longer at the proceeding part. So I oh, said sure. they were signing in. So just see if there's anybody else else present that uh, came after we after seven. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, did anybody join late um, in the list? I went down the sample ballot. So please let yourself known if you have joined late and. Uh, we will do a double check before our last item of business. So, And thank you all for the invitation again. Stay safe and healthy. Check out ChelseaArdwin.com. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Hannigan and Mr. Governor, would you like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, so, hey guys, my name is Tay Governor. Um, if you probably see in the camera, I got my little girl with me if she's in the shot. So my mom is currently not at home right now. And so I'm on dad duty tonight, uh, but it's great to be with you all. Um, I will be the, uh, what we call a campus pastor for the church that we're building. Bethany Church has a property on Canal Street. Um, for those of you that have driven by, I've seen it. it's located at 3700 Canal Street, right by Mandina's. 
And so we're currently remodeling that property uh, for one of our campuses. Bethany Church is a church mostly based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but we do have a campus in Homa and some of the surrounding greater Baton Rouge area. And so we've been renovating that property now for several months, um, getting that ready to start our campus. So just a quick update, all that stuff is moving along really well. Uh, we believe that the church will be able to start in the month of May. So really just a couple months away from the start of that. Um, so we're letting people know at this point that the launch time will be um, towards the end of May. It could be a little bit earlier, but we're just saying in general right now, May 2021. Uh, we don't have any significant issues right now. I think the biggest thing as far as the neighborhood that we're you know, working to make sure, make sure. that we do um, our diligence in you know, keeping good order and peace in the neighborhood is just making sure we really think through our parking. Our building does have a parking lot, but that can fill up potentially quickly just depending on how many people want to come and be a part. So definitely want to, you know, for you all that are in the neighborhood, connected with the neighborhood to help us as things do get going, just be our eyes and our ears. Um, how we can just best serve that neighborhood. We definitely want to be a benefit and a blessing to the neighborhood and in no way a burden whatsoever. And so we would love for you guys to keep us updated. I'll share in here a number for me in the chat, also an email that goes directly to me. So if you guys have any concerns, any questions, you guys will be able to directly reach out and connect with me. And I would love to answer those in any way, shape, uh, any way, shape or form that I can do that. So that's pretty much it. Um, like I said, nothing too much beyond that. Uh, we're excited to be in the city. Uh, my wife and I moved from Baton Rouge, Louisiana here right before Thanksgiving. So we've been loving the city. My mom's from the West Bank. So definitely know um, New Orleans a little bit when we come and visit family, but uh, honored to just be on the ground. So that's us. If there's any questions, let me know. And other than that, that's us. Uh, people are asking, uh, is there plans to rebuild basketball hoop? Uh, from what I understand, no, uh, the, there's not a plan to rebuild that hoop uh, that's located in our parking lot. So from what I understand right now, I do not think so, uh, that there will not be plans to, to, to rebuild that. But that's good to know that people did use it before construction. Um, we might be able to look into something that we can provide, um, that we can just set up and have available um, whenever the church is not meeting. So it's great. It's great to know that people did use that uh, before construction started. Yeah, any other construction updates right now? Or I know there's been, you know, a lot of work going on. So it's glad yeah. to see it. Yeah, well, yeah, it's going to be awesome whenever it's done. Like I said, everything's moving forward. Great. Uh, we do, if any of you guys, you're more than welcome to come. We're actually having an open house. Um, we're having an open house on March 20th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, the building will not be completed, but it will be an opportunity for just small groups of people to come and tour the facility um, obviously, we can't have any you know, large groups, any gatherings right now until we have everything up to code, all safety features and everything. But there will just be an open house where small groups can come and walk through while construction won't be happening during that time. So it will be on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if any of you guys want to come and see the progress that we currently are, um, we, you're, we're, you're more than welcome. There'll be some light refreshments available. And like I was saying, it's an open house. So you can show up any time between that 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, just to come by if you want to stop by for five minutes, 15, 20, however long you would like to come and see. Um, I'm looking here at some of the questions. Neighbors are quite upset about the green ash tree being cut down. Um, OK, that's good to know. I know we do. We, uh, we meet every Wednesday. We meet with the construction team just to make sure um, that any trees that are being removed or are being taken down, um, that it is that it's on our property and that we're able to do that. But then also to let everyone know, and we're letting everyone know this, the amount of landscaping that's gonna go into that area, everything that we're doing, it's gonna look so beautiful. And so do keep us updated if there's any, you know, like I said, gray areas where if we are removing something, we do not plan on removing much at all. That's already in that neighborhood that people consider beautiful. I do know there are a couple of things that we did have to uh, remove. and. Um, but if you hear of anything else, but just know that we are putting a lot back into that entire area and we're expecting it to look even more beautiful than it was before. So hopefully uh, that will kind of help with some of that. Now, as far as the church bells are concerned, uh, we'll have to look into that. I can't make any guarantees that we'll be ringing the church bells in the morning. I'm sure uh, I'm sure Hank would love it if we did that, but uh, I'll uh, I'll have to see if that's in the plan. So I'll definitely keep that in mind, but I can't make any promises on us ringing church bells before before everything starts. Could I make one more comment? It's just too long to type out, Ted. Please. This is Mary, and hey, Mary. I'm the one that asked about the green uh, the green ash trees. Absolutely. I just want you all to be aware of the fact that those four green ashes were planted by the neighbors 
um, about 25 years ago. Okay. And there's been quite an emotional investment in them. They survived Katrina. And we had shared with Hank, <clears throat> excuse me, how invested we were emotionally in those trees. Mm -hmm. And that's why everybody was just so distraught to all of a sudden have that one of them cut down. Yeah. And that does leave three of them standing, only one on Telemachus and two on Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would hope that you would recognize that they are something very, very special to the neighborhood. And they are absolutely magnificent, beautiful trees. The Sweet Bay Magnolias y'all are planning on putting in will be very nice, but mm -hmm. nothing like mature green ashes. Absolutely, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure um, that it has been, you know, a significant loss for people who, yeah, you grow up in the neighborhood, you know it, you get to know the places and the familiar scenery that adds it being home. I know that not everything that's home is necessarily on a government regulated property line. And so um, we definitely can sympathize uh, with that frustration. And uh, I am glad that we were able to keep as many as we are that, you know, it was not in the plans, nor was it our desire to do anything more than that. So we definitely hear you and thank you for sharing that. And, uh, and we do hope that the little bit that we are able to add to it is in just some way um, us just trying to show our care and appreciation for the neighborhood as well. I know in no way could it replace it fully, especially like you said, for things like Katrina, things that it's weathered in um, the neighborhood. But we also hope that um, you guys know that in no way do we are we trying to devalue um, or step on uh, the neighborhood or do we think we're coming into that neighborhood and not trying to honor um, just the, the the time and the history that is that has gone into that. So I really appreciate you sharing that, Mary. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's call for any questions or comments, Mr. Governor. Well, great to meet you. Thank you for showing up this evening. Yeah, and, glad uh, to be here. We'll see more of you soon. Excited oh. for the opening. All right, on down the line. I believe that's the last order of business on the agenda. Did anybody else uh, for the congressional race join late? They want to introduce themselves. All right, any other items anybody wanted to bring up? Any announcements uh, that weren't covered on the agenda? All right, uh, Mr. Governor put his contact information in the chat as well for anyone who needs that. So thank you so much for attending. This was uh, our March meeting. Our next few, our next meeting I believe is uh, April 12th and um, our other meetings were listed, meetings were listed in, in, the, in newsletter. the newsletter. Sorry, Sorry. I'm trying to find, my, to information. find my information. Also coming up, coming the up, Mississippi, Mississippi Security District, District, District Commissioner, Commissioner, meeting Commissioner meeting is on, is on March, 17th. March 17th is its usual schedule. schedule. And plus, plus. The third district third NOPD non-PAC meeting is coming up. We'll post the join information once it's disseminated. That's going to be Wednesday, April 7th. Um, if you want to sign up for the distribution list of the join information, please email Officer St. Charles. So, all right. All right. Thank you all for, Thank attending. You all for attending. Have, a great, Have a great week. Thank you, Chris. Chris. Hey, Chris, this is Nathan Markward. It's my first meeting. Do, hey, do you publish hey, the meetings or the minutes? I'm sorry. Uh, I published uh, the, the videos. Okay, great. Thank you very much.